We have on our panel Secretary Betsy DeVos, Dr. Alveda King, our Secretary of Education from Virginia, uh, Secretary Gadara, and we also have Skip Hansen, who is president and founder of Learn for Life. So we're going to start our questions with you, Secretary Gadara. What is schooling today? How is it delivered? And who should be involved? Great. I'll try. I know we have a lot to talk about. So yes. Agree. The bottom line is uh, school is not what we're seeing on that screen in the inspirational video, right? This one size fits all approach um, is what the norm is. And we know that that is not working for most of our families and for our kids. And we need to do everything possible as Learn for Life is doing of seeing every child, meeting where they are and realizing that we need to personalize learning and the learning experience for every family. And the people who need to be in charge of that are families themselves, that they have the choice to pick where they need to go. And we need a culture of innovation within our public system, outside of it. We need to stop thinking about where this is happening and instead prioritize and put urgency behind making sure that we are losing generation after generation because we aren't doing this. And it is immoral, right? We are not meeting people where they are. And for some reason, we're OK with that as a country. And that needs to stop today. And so it's about how do we break the, the focus on the status quo and start demanding change that so those stories of those students become the norm everywhere. Great. And Secretary DeVos, the United States has not seen a glimpse of the top 20 in any subjects tested in recent years when comparing the assessment results from over 500,000 students in over 65 different countries. You have recently said that the Department of Education should not exist. Why do you believe that's true? Well, Michelle, um, since 1979, when the Department of Education was founded as a political payoff to the teachers' unions by Jimmy Carter promising that for their endorsement in 1976, we've spent over a trillion dollars at the federal level alone with the express purpose of closing the achievement gap. And by every measure, pre even pre-COVID, not only has it not narrowed one little bit, it's actually widened by many different measures. And so you have to ask yourself, what value has the Department of Education added when, in fact, it only contributes 8 or 9% of what we spend on K-12 uh, education, which is around $750 billion annually, uh, 8 or 9%, and yet everything that comes from that department comes with massive strings and, and also agendas and is imposed on states and local districts. And so there, there, it is not adding value. There are two functions that the department does, laws that have to, have to be followed and could be done in other departments, um, making sure civil rights are protected and making sure students with disabilities um, are supported in appropriate ways. But that does not need to have a whole Department of Education. All of those funds could be much better spent uh, at the local level and importantly by parents and families to decide where their child is educated. And so we've also learned, Secretary DeVos, that decades ago that choice provides options to families who may not have had them before. How does flexibility allow students and families the freedom to pursue life goals as well as academic goals? Well, uh, as, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, education is really the least disrupted industry in our country, and it is an industry. And uh, if you empower families and empower students to find their right fit, the creativity and ingenuity, ingenuity that will follow um, when there is a full marketplace of consumers ready to buy something different, uh, we, I, we, I don't think any of us here on this stage can begin to even dream about the extent to which the, the different needs and demands can be met. And I, I uh, use an example of a, a small school I've not yet visited, but it's in West Michigan where I live. Now, in West Michigan in the winter, it's very cold. We have snow. And um, this particular little school is an all, all outdoor, all day, every day school all year round. Mm -hmm. And they have waiting lists of kids wanting to get into this school and teachers who choose to be there. And I use it just as one small example of thinking more broadly about how and where children can learn 
And, um, and, and really, it, it, I, I think unleashing the marketplace will ultimately bring about the kind of uh, choices and options, and importantly for families, the flexibility to be able to customize every child's education. Thank you for that. And Skip, uh, Secretary DeVos talked about uh, allowing parents flexibility. I wanted to ask you about Learn for Life as a whole. Um, how does Learn for Life provide that flexibility for parents and families to pursue their life goals as well as academic goals? Yeah, I, I completely agree. We we started 20 years ago. We're celebrating 20 years this year um, for 50 kids in a little town called Lancaster, California that uh, were foster care youth, pregnant teens, uh, and a few other bullying uh, issues that we were having in our little town. And we found that there just wasn't a home. There was a, a regular high school that had a four-year plan with boxes that took you from freshman to senior. Uh, and there was other school called a continuation school, which is where they typically put the kids that got in trouble. But if you were a pregnant teen, right in your freshman year, you drop out, you go raise your baby, you want to come back, your box has moved on mm -hmm. with a sophomore box, but your education is still a freshman. So they put you over in the other box, where the kids dropped out. The young girl was making good grades but didn't want to actually go to this continuation school, which is unfortunately where they put the worst teachers uh, and they usually are in the back of the campus and it's really not a great situation. So we created a school literally with the idea of, of a flexible schedule, with the idea that when I was in college, I set my schedule up Tuesdays and Thursdays so I could work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Friday to help pay for college. We just brought that down to the high school level and fortunately, California did have uh, a mechanism for us to get paid in that environment. But what we realized right away was there are thousands of kids in our little city because the dropout rate was supposedly you know, less than 12%, but we had 4,000 kids come into our centers. Mm -hmm. um, and what we realized, it was a scheduling problem, this idea that not every student learns the same way. Man, how many of you have kids that might have ADD or just don't do well five days a week, don't do mornings well? Uh, don't even like to wake up early in the morning because they, they might have uh, deficiencies. So we created a program that catered to the individual student. Mm -hmm. And our biggest struggle legislatively is uh, the states still have a butts and seats requirement where the kids need to be there five days a week. And that works for many. But what we've seen, because we're serving close to 50,000 students this year and close to 100 locations, is it doesn't work for a lot. And post-COVID, I am telling you, you are going to have an onslaught of dropouts headed in your direction. And you don't have a crime problem in your cities, you have an education problem. Without a high school diploma, an opportunity to join the military, get a job, um, those kids are gonna hit your streets. And you mentioned it in second grade, they pick the prison beds, how many prison beds they're gonna need, eight, 12 years out based on their second and third grade math and reading scores. So we already know that those kids are moving towards our schools, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, over the next six years, and they're gonna be headed in that direction. So flexible schedule is certainly one of the most important things for the kids that you saw in that video today. Yes, thank you so much for that. And continuing on the theme of flexibility, Dr. King, the pandemic illuminated how flexibility is needed in school, uh, in school models, and as we've said several times today, one size does not fit all. How can flexibility in attendance provide additional options for disadvantaged students? Well, as a parent, as a grandparent, we the people, that's who we the people in every city, state, and this nation across the land, we the people have to live with our children, nurture our children, educate our children, and I do agree we really don't have a crime problem. We have an education problem. We get the work ethic back, and students, children should either be learning, working, or praying, and recreating. And that's very hard still in this nation because right now everybody wants to work or not. After COVID, people are trying to figure out how not to go back to work. We have that as well. Mm -hmm. And so with the flexibility issues, we're finding that more people are staying at home and working from home. Mm -hmm. So the children may be there at home, and now children go to school some of the hours and some hours they don't. So the flexibility issue must be addressed state by state. And state legislators, if you're on your education committees, I was, as a state legislator, I was on the education committee, and we had to examine all of these issues as well. I was very disturbed to hear that second graders 
were performing so poor, poorly and America did not know it. Mm -hmm. And I said, why didn't America know that? That was hidden. So it's time to look at the issues of flexibility, mm -hmm. of learning, and indeed, they can determine by the second grade if the students are not learning and reading, they will not succeed in society and they'll end up as criminals. So they need to be educated. Okay. So that is part of our responsibility, your responsibility now as legislators, to carefully examine these issues state by state and district by district. Thank you so much for that. And just to continue, Dr. King, how can we ensure that parents, students, educators, most of all policymakers, have the right information to guide their actions so that every student can be successful. Parents have to learn to care again, to inquire again, to do what happened in Virginia. Stand up and say, we see what you're doing now. We do not agree with what you're doing now. And that should translate into votes. Too long, America has stayed at home and said, let the government take care of it, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll fix it. Well, it's time for us to be engaged as we the people, praying for our legislators, working with our legislators, communicating with our legislators. And I believe many of you are doing a good job when you're hearing from your communities. I believe you're responding. But there need to be more town hall meetings. There need to be more inquiries. And there need to be more conversations like this in every district in this nation. Thank you. And Secretary Gadara, Virginia is fourth in the nation in mathematics. So um, it's a very necessary skill to enter the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. How can we make sure that, and I will ask this question to more than you, so yes. be prepared, panelists. Um, how can we ensure that our workforce is competitive in the future? So I'll take two parts of this. One, I actually question whether we're fourth. If you look at averages, we probably are. But again, part of my storyline is the averages hide that we really aren't doing that well with a lot of math. When we look at our numbers and dis disaggregate it by different populations, we're failing a lot of kids in teaching math. And so this is why one of our priorities working with our legislators is going to be doing what we did on the Literacy Act with the Math Act next year in this next session to make sure that our math curriculum, our math standards are really aligned to what employers need. And you know, we are working really hard in Virginia to attract the greatest companies in the world to come here. Um, and, be, and we're gonna do that by investing in people and being a, a talent machine. Uh, and that starts in K-12. And so a huge part to answer your question about how do we do this is how do we make sure we remind everybody that the purpose of education is to get a job, to be ready for success. And so one of the things we're doing in Virginia is to ensure that we are using labor market information to really inform and to inspire about what's happening in K-12 in our and in our two and four year schools. So one of the things is we are developing, we think one of the best labor market information systems in the country, um, and that we're using that data to also um, let teachers know about what the skills are that are required for the future. Second of all, we are trying to do everything possible to bring employers into our classrooms, what we saw in the video, in terms of mentorships, internships, workplace experiences. We actually, just in our legislation this past year, also made it possible for, we, our goal is to have every a graduate of a two and four year school to have a paid internship so there's exposure to work. So this needs to happen in K-12 and in post-secondary. And lastly, we need to make sure that we have innovation that employers are welcome into our schools to learn side by side and to bring best in class and to give exposure, provide exposure to why academic achievement matters to success in the world of work. So we're trying to better align employer needs with what we're providing in education to make sure that we're reminding people. The goal is not to get a piece of paper uh, and to say that you graduated. The goal is to have the skills, the knowledge, the competencies to get a job. Thank you. Dr. King, how do we create a competitive workforce? There was a very good program uh, that has been around for a while and it was called STEM, S-T-E-M, and now it is S-T-E-A-M mm -hmm. because it added arts and entertainment. And in, in the 45th administration, women were included, especially in areas of math and technology. So find out what is available and then be very innovative in getting work ethic oriented programs back to the families in each of your communities. So the work ethic has been kind of cut off, but it needs to come back. And to teach these young people and even returning citizens and maybe parents who want to get back in the game, these programs are very important. 
Yeah, Secretary DeVos, I would like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I thought uh, Secretary G um, Gadara's uh, response was uh, right on, and I, I would say that all of those things are enhanced in an environment of education freedom where families are actually driving uh, you know, the demand for what their children need, and you couple that with a much more engaged private sector uh, that is actually welcomed into the education world and environment, and it, it will change the dynamic considerably and, uh, and, and prepare kids at a much earlier age to consider what their full range of options are, not just one track in through a, a, you know, a predetermined um, destiny. Thank Can I add you. on to that for a sec? Sorry, I know we're all the same. <laughs> no, go ahead. This whole idea of having career pathways and also blowing up this idea that the only way to success in America is through a four-year degree and that if you don't do that, you're a failure. And I think that we just need to have this culture, cultural change of work ethic and there are so many skilled trades and we need to make sure that there is no one way to success in this country. And so it made this country great and so we need to do that. So. Uh, Skip, I just have to ask you about career technical education and the workforce because it's what Learn for Life does. I'll wrap it up. Uh, you know, we have a just open. I was telling Secretary DeVos we just opened up a school in Flint, Flint, Michigan. If you know anything about Flint, they don't just have a water problem; they have a huge education problem. They closed all their high schools except for one on the east side of town, um, and they're bus trying to bus kids all over the place. Along with the poverty in that community, it is just heartbreaking. We walked in there immediately saw a need opened up two centers, they're full already. COVID sort of set us back because we had a lot of those kids uh, literally just you know, without food, clothing at our schools. But the next step is to connect them with the local businesses. Flint is actually coming back. There's some really good industry moving in. Uh, they don't need college degrees uh, to get a job. These are great jobs. So our hope is uh, connections to the businesses and have them come and, and tell us what these kids need to learn. We've done it in California and Texas with UPS and said, what do they need to know before they walk out? What point of sale machine, that sort of thing. But on the tech side, we have so many kids that are, you know, the, the gamers, you have them, you probably have kids of your own that they get involved with these games. They're really, in ta they're really talented mm -hmm. and there's a lot of companies that need our kids. Unfortunately, um, we do just need more funding in order to make it happen. And we're really leaning on businesses, not the states, to step up. We've had companies come and say, we want you to put your school in our four walls. A uh, solar company out in California said, we can't find installers, we can't find technicians. Will you put your school here and market to your students to come to our school teaching this skill set? And it's been a huge help. So that's, that's wonderful. Future, yeah. Thank you. And our last question, Secretary Gadara, your department recently released a report called Our Commitment to Virginians that highlighted some of the underlying problems facing public education in the state, summing it up as lower expectations, wider gaps, and lack of transparency. What is your commitment to Virginia students, and what are some of the initiatives that you've introduced to help fulfill that commitment? So I could talk all day long about this and I'm watching the flashing red numbers, so I'll be really fast. One, we're gonna make sure that every parent, every student, and every teacher has the information on the children for whom they're responsible. I believe deeply in also engaging students and having their own agency, having their data, and understanding where they are, and we have not been telling students the truth either. And we wanna also make sure that we are working and making sure that parents and teachers are working as a team. So we've opened an office of parent and teacher engagement. We are gonna make sure that we are training all of our teachers so they know how to communicate with parents, how to see this as a partnership, and how do we also create a personalized learning plan and personalized data picture for every student who's behind so that by the end of next year, all of our teachers will understand where their kids are, what they need to do, what's the plan, and how do we communicate this as a team so that all of our students have a plan for success. That's one, so transparency is critical in making sure parents have access to that information, as well as our teachers, to be blunt, who've never had access to the data they need to make the decisions that they need to make. Second of all, we're gonna focus on learning loss all the time. We're putting into place high doses tutoring. We have a partnership that we're announcing with our HBCUs and going into our communities, which need not just the tutoring, but mentoring. We need to instill hope. We need to expose kids to 
opportunities and seeing people that look like them and are being successful and how do we breed this, this, this connection of humans also. So learning loss is going to be a big piece. Micro grants we're going to do to empower families with specific, with dollars that they can use to invest in that learning loss piece. Um, and third of all, innovation, right? This $100 million I talked about in my remarks for these lab schools is critical for starting a culture in Virginia of celebrating and identifying innovative approaches so that we can start chipping away at everything needing to look the same and everybody learning the same way at all times. Um, and we've got to start and celebrate that and bring that innovation into our schools across the Commonwealth. And so we'll be announcing that and getting that $100 million out into the hands of people who are going to make a difference in changing the lives of kids. How wonderful. I want to thank Alec for focusing on education during our lunch session today. It's one of the most critical issues in the country. So we want to thank you for that. And on behalf of Learn for Life and the Education Task Force, we would like to thank our panelists. Could you please give them a big round of applause?